So when ingested, this well, the body quickly converts psilocybin to psilocin, which is an agonist at multiple serotonin, serotonergic receptors. And it's got its highest affinity towards the serotonin 2A type. First, I'll go into the results from these studies to date, and then I'll explain how exactly we think it's so effective. So at least six clinical trials have reported improvements in depressive symptoms over the last 15 years. Now, most of these include one to two administrations of psilocybin uh, and supported psychotherapy. Now, these studies are pretty consistent in that there's a significant improvement in depressive symptoms reported and observed by the subjects. What's even more promising is that these effects are long lasting with the follow-up studies now demonstrating the significant reduction of symptoms recorded persists after 12 months. In terms of success rate, I'll refer to the most relevant study in that it was pretty recent and done specifically on individuals with major depressive disorder. And it was also a high quality uh, randomized control trial. Now in this study, 71% of the participants on both week one and four after treatment experienced a reduction in depressive symptoms by over 50%. And of these, 54% of these people experienced complete remission, meaning they no longer fit the criteria for clinical depression. This is obviously very impressive. Psilocybin is most commonly known due to its, well, it being the active compound in magic mushrooms. And the effects following the ingestion of psilocybin are, are commonly referred to as a trip. Now, the acute subjective changes, so i.e. the kind of perceived experience during trips, are usually that of a significant change in thought pattern, uh, behavior, and this, this really unique experience of ego dissolution. And when I say ego dissolution, I'm referring to this experience of this, the perceived boundary that we all have between the self and the world that we inhabit. And during the trip, this momentarily breaks or at least becomes less apparent. This in and of itself can be extremely profound as an experience. Like most of us live our lives holding on to this self-constructed identity of ourselves. Uh, some of this sense of self is necessary to play a role in our daily life, but a lot of it isn't. Uh, and it's exactly this sense of self, which is, well, here you synonymously with the ego that is responsible for the boundary that we perceive to be well to be present between us and the outside world It's this disconnect between our ego and everything outside of it that often causes or at the very least heightens the mental suffering that we often endure and so this ego dissolution the the, the feeling of kind of letting go however temporary can be extremely profound that's the subjective experience reported. But what's my main concern here is how exactly this compound manages to induce these, these long lasting effects, effects that persist far beyond the metabolization of an excretion of this particular compound. Now, the only feasible answer to this relates to neuroplasticity, which is, in other words, just the structural and and or functional change of neuronal networks that were responsible for the previously depressed states. So how exactly neuroplasticity occurs in psilocybin? Now, neuroplasticity, as we know, simply put, is just the ability of the neuronal networks within our brains to change through growth and reorganization. It can do this functionally in the ways that the neurons behave and also structurally in the way that the neurons are structured. So our neocortex is composed of six layers and psilocybin stimulates the 5-HT2A receptors or serotonergic receptors, uh, serotonergic 2A receptors in layer five and six pyramidal neurons and as well as the uh, GABAergic interneurons. Now, the net effect appears to be the excitation of layer five pyramidal neurons and because of this, increased levels of the neurotransmitter glutamate. And this results in greater stimulation of a particular type of glutamate receptor, named the AMPA receptor. The molecular pathways, uh, such as the mTOR pathway and others, 
which follow after the stimulation of this AMPA receptor is outside the scope of this video as it gets very technical and I, well, I also appreciate that I'm venturing dangerously close to mechanisms that I have relatively basic knowledge of. What I will do is link the studies below for those who are interested in the details. I have read it though, um, and really the takeaway is that this AMPA receptor stimulation triggers a positive feedback loop, which leads to a sustained AMPA activation. And it's this sustained activation of both the AMPA receptors and mTOR as well as the activity of the serotonin 2A receptors and other glutamate receptors, which appears to be necessary for this enhanced neuroplasticity that continues to occur following the stimulation with psilocybin. Now, the neuroplastic effects, well, they remain local to the neurons stimulated that express these serotonin 2A receptors that psilocybin initially um, activated because the, the, the molecular pathways that triggered act locally in the place in which they are, well, in which they started. Basically what this means is that the structural and the functional effects that psilocybin might have on the brain circuitry is likely to be in areas that are dense with these serotonin 2A receptors. Now, the data suggests that various signs of enhanced neuroplasticity arise within one to six hours of administration of psilocybin, and it tends to taper off within five days. And this lasts for at least one month, as in the changes within those five days last for at least one month after the treatment of psilocybin. I'll now go on to where exactly these neuroplastic changes occur with psilocybin. I'll first highlight um, the abnormalities that have been observed in the structure and the function of the brains of those with people who have depression. Depression is obviously complicated and it's multifaceted, but at least as it relates to what well, arguably the most significant component to the cognitive aspect which characterizes depression, being that of a kind of negative state of perpetual rumination. Well, we can do a pretty good job at explaining what could be going on here with the neuroimaging studies that have been performed so far. Specifically, I'm going to speak of what is commonly referred to as the triple network model, which comprises three networks. Anybody who's interested in psilocybin may have already heard of this one. It's called the default mode network. The other two are the salience network and the executive network. Each of these networks consist of a group of interconnected brain structures, which together form a functional system. So first, the default mode network. Its name comes from the fact that it's most active whenever we are, well, we're not engaged in an activity which demands our attention. It's, it's often active when we're in a, in a state of wakeful rest, when we're kind of not engaged in anything particular. We often, unfortunately, engage in a kind of thought that often doesn't have an explicit goal in mind. And, and this, this often leads to kind of daydreaming, uh, recalling memories, envisioning the future, uh, thinking of others. This, as a collective, is often referred to as just simply mind-wandering. And this is what the DMN is responsible for. Now, the executive network is the network responsible for executive functioning. And this is often needed for goal-orientative, well, goal-orientated, cognitively demanding tasks. And the last one, the salience network, this can be seen really as the bridge between the DMN and the EN, the default mode network and the executive network. It's responsible for modulating the, well, the switch between the internally directed cognition of the default mode network and the externally directed cognition of the executive network. Now, as it relates to these three networks in depression, depression is characterized by this hyper connectivity and subsequent overactivity of the default mode network and to add to this we see this hypo connectivity so a reduction in connectivity between the default mode network and other higher order brain networks and these include the executive network and the salience network so we get this excessive mind wandering which is caused by this overactivity of the default mode network 
but you also have this reduced ability to divert attention away from this this perpetual and often negative state of mind wandering as a consequence of these weak connections to the higher order networks that are responsible for doing this. So where psilocybin comes in, it's it's in its observed role in altering the connectivity of these networks. And interestingly, the, the serotonin 2A receptor is highly, res- well, it's highly expressed in a pattern that resembles a map of the uh, default mode network, the salience network and the executive network and the connections between all of them. And if you remember, I previously spoke about the fact that the neuroplastic changes occur local to where the serotonin 2A receptors that psilocybin works on are expressed. And as expected, this is what has been shown. After one day of psilocybin, what is seen is a decrease in the within DMN connectivity responsible for the negative rumination and an increase in the DMN connectivity with the higher order networks, including the executive network and the salience network. And this would be the, well, this would be responsible for the switching and directing cognition externally. Now, this is thought to be largely responsible for what is often referred to in studies as the global decrease in network modularity after psilocybin. This decrease in network modularity and an increase in flexibility, this may be important in the what well, important in the, the in the treatment of other disorders that are largely a result of this kind of cognitive inflexibility. Uh, disorders such as OCD, autism, and and others. I mean, this decrease in network modularity, what's by definition also involves an increase in the communication between these networks with other networks, ordinarily outside their community limits. But it's this communication which likely leads to the therapeutic change in the individual that is suffering with these with these disease states. In a sense, it it, it works to free them up from from a long-held pattern of excessive self-focus and rumination. So in relation to uh, the administration of psilocybin, because the neuroplastic changes also occur in an experience-dependent manner, experiences that people have during and around the treatment, well, they have a greater psychological impact than otherwise would have been the case. And so this is why the supplementation with psychotherapy alongside other considerations to the treatment setting is really an essential part to the dosing protocol and hopefully the therapeutic change that could occur. So the the majority of clinical trials have administered two separate doses at a dose of roughly 25 milligrams with each dose given roughly three to four weeks apart. Now the subjects were either seated or lay down in these experiments with an eye mask on and this is to avoid the distractions of visual hallucinations which can actually be um, well they can be frequent with some and they can also impede the therapeutic process now it's odd to read this in studies but music is also critical and this is due to its effects on specifically gently guiding the emotional experience which is often much more intense during a trip now, music advised in the studies is, well, the, the, the protocol advised with music in the studies is to start calm and then moving on to slightly kind of more upbeat or at least kind of a bit of percussion uh, during the peak effects around two hours in and then kind of tapering it back down again to more calming music towards the end. And the trip usually lasts roughly four to six hours. Now, as it relates to the psychotherapy, Generally, in historic studies, the psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy protocol consists of pre-treatment, treatment, treatment, and post-treatment sessions. Now, there were several conventional psychotherapeutic modalities that were mentioned, which were obviously modified for use in the psilocybin clinical trials. It's not particularly clear, and I wish it was, but most commonly used psychotherapeutic modalities were CBT and existential psychotherapy. Now, these conventional therapies were almost always in the pre- or post-treatment sessions. During the treatment sessions, the therapist served as more of a guide, more so just providing the, the reassurance and gentle guidance if needed. And now the average number of pre-treatment sessions were about three. The treatment sessions were, as previously mentioned, around two, because there were two administrations of psilocybin. 
and the number of post-treatment sessions were around six. So in sum, generally with two doses of 25 to 30 milligrams of psilocybin spaced a few weeks apart with assisted psychotherapy and the appropriate setting during treatment sessions, these are the kind of things that will maximize the efficacy that psilocybin can have.